welcome back to the second part of May 2012. Uh, let's see if we can get through all of May in 30 minutes. We're back at the oregano. This is second year. A lot of these plants, if they're perennials, are going to flower in their second year. And oregano is really neat when it flowers. I just like it. I just love watching things grow and survive and thrive and uh, without pesticides, without everything. Let's move on into some more of these pictures. Here's one of the birch trees. I just wanted to take some picture with the different lighting. And I just think the birches look so much better than they did the year previous. We'll probably have to do some pruning on all these trees in the winter. And that's when you want to do your pruning is in the winter after the uh, sort of the first freeze, if you're lucky enough to have a winter. But once the leaves drop, wait a couple weeks. Wait a couple weeks, and then that's when you should do your pruning. But we'll have to, as you can see in this picture, here's another one of those birch trees on the back right. There's some water sprouts. These are these sprouts that are coming up halfway down the trunk. Uh, these are the thing, the branches that are going to be crossing one another. Because these were bought probably from either Home Depot or Lowe's years and years ago. Uh, we, we sell all these trees at Home Depot and Lowe's, and which is nice because they're natives. You know, at least they're natives. But when you transplant some of these trees uh, that have been grown in a nursery, a lot of times you will see strange growth patterns going on with them because they're so out of whack from the years spent in a container. But anyway, this photo, dead center. Here's another one of those house finches. And if you could zoom in like I am right now, it kind of looks like he's staring right at me. But they really don't care too much. They're sort of skittish, but they'll get used to you if you don't spend too much time running around. If you pick a nice, you know, cool, comfortable place to rest, you know, and watch them, they'll come out. They'll fly down and they'll start stripping the seeds out. As you can see in the left-hand side of this picture, all that brown, those are the plants they've already worked over. You know what's great? I just noticed I hadn't seen it before for some reason, but there's a cardinal swooping into the garden in this photo as well. If you look uh, top left, and there's just this blur of red that's actually a cardinal who he's he's flying into the garden. I know it's a cardinal even though he's blurred because his whole body is red. I said I don't know my birds very well, but you know cardinals are. If you don't know what cardinal is, and you live in North Carolina, that's just crazy because they're our state bird. Oh my goodness, I can't believe this. I wish I could zoom in for you guys. Uh, hard to see again, but I'll try to point them out. There are two more birds in this photo. Really cool, I'm excited. Uh, see the two bamboo poles that are in the center? Look at the left one all the way at the top. You may have already spotted this one. Uh, she, I'm going to say it's a she because it's not very bright plumage or anything, uh, is hanging out, perched, looking around. That doesn't look like a house finch, so it's probably something else. But then, if you only go, you know, about uh, maybe an inch on your screen, top left from there, uh, where the bamboo trellis is peeking out through the branches of the birch, you can see that there's it's leaning up on the fence way out there in the background. There's a splotch of yellow, and that's another type of finch. This is a goldfinch. So there are probably four different species of birds in this photo alone. Uh, again, you sit out for about 20 minutes. 20 minutes is about a magical time for everything to sort of get used to your presence. I've talked about that before. Let's go on to some other pictures so I don't get too excited. This is a transplanted pepper that looks really pathetic. He's not getting a lot of sun, as you can guess, because these are the base of mustard plants to the right and left of it's being framed by mustard so it's actually not getting a lot of sun right now uh, which is good because as a transplant as a transplant you don't want them being out there full sun getting smacked down uh, having to water them constantly uh, before they get their feet in so this way I put it into the understory of these plants that are still providing nectar they're still structuring the soil all of that so it's, it's a good nursery place for it the really big seed pods that are running up directly up from it and all the way on the far left, those are daikon radish seeds. They didn't really get eaten too much by the birds, uh, but we have a lot of daikon radish seeds. Next photo, here's the base of one of those Osaka purple mustard plants. They were really big around. They were probably a good three inches solid thick right there at the base of the ground. And you can just imagine that it's breaking up the soil for us, feeding the soil. Unfortunately, they're not mycorrhizal hosts. Uh, 
but you know what, we've got other plants that are growing around it. So, you know, everything doesn't have to do, uh, isn't going to check every box for you. But mustard is an excellent ground cover. It's an excellent green manure plant. Here it is again. Same plant, zoomed out. You've seen this before. Uh, some images back, I didn't talk, I don't think I mentioned it, but this comfrey plant, uh, two weeks ago or so, was completely chopped off at the base, and it's already about halfway to full size. So, you know, once a month, you can actually cut these back like once a month in our climate because they rapidly regrow. Not much change is going on in here, though. These are all looking pretty similar. Here's the parsley once again. I took a lot of pictures this day. I'm not really sure why. This is the 22nd of May. And thick ground cover once again. Good to see. Now you can see where I've chopped and dropped. Uh, just taking each bed, going bed by bed. Uh, being careful not to chop down any of the cilantro that's flowering. Being careful not to, uh, you know, get anything else. Because there are other plants growing in here as well. We've got lettuces and... Uh, garlic, every, lots of different things. We transplanted tobacco into here as well uh, after we chopped and dropped. And now you can see sort of where pathways would be. If you were there in person, you would know where the pathways are, uh, but this exposure isn't showing it too well. Chop and drop, tucking everything back in around the plants. as really thick garlic in its second year growing there. Again, we don't harvest all of our garlic because we have so much of it, and that's tobacco. There's two tobacco plants growing in here. This is underneath the willow tree. This is up by the old green guild transition zone with the swale running across the top left to top right of the screen. This is all the lettuce that self-seeded and is growing all by itself. And the echinacea in the bottom right-hand corner. Top left is lemon balm as well as oregano with red clover. And there's a small comfrey plants on the back end of the swale as well that we had transplanted and they're starting to get their feet. Same image, just zoomed out a little bit more. Echinacea flower head starting to form. I'm just waiting and waiting on those. The anticipation is intense. This photo you can see just how much we've chopped back around the cilantro. If you look into the background where the, the cilantro plants that are being hung, strung up by uh, bamboo poles you could, those were all thickly with red clover, and now we've chopped it all back. The rhizo deposition has happened, so we've broken up some of the soil. We've added uh, dead organic matter that's going to be decomposing. It's going to be eaten by all the soil organisms, and then we've added on top of it a whole thick layer of green mulch. So good things are happening. Here's a close-up of some of the lettuce. With There's garlic growing up through all this as well diverse diversity is king and the good thing is you know I could go through and I have before I can mention almost every single plant in here I know what it is and why we put it in here so it's not diversity for diversity's sake which is something else that a lot of lead designers talk about you don't just want to throw out a million and a half species and say ha ah, I've got 300 different species growing. You know, we may not have the best combination of plants going on here, but we're, we're trying to experiment and think along the lines of, you know, root types, um, leaf types, the different types of shade that they're going to produce, how tall are they going to get, when do they fruit, when do they flower, X, Y, Z, trying to at least get some kind of semblance of a symphony going on instead of just a lot of white noise. Looking up into the green guild. We don't have to do too much watering. Kale and lettuce growing in here too, self-seeded. There's lettuce running along the fence, top left-hand corner. There's cilantro. All these plants that just come up by themselves. It's great. Now this is into that old Four Sisters. Those... Um, overarching mustard plants. They've been worked over by the finches. And you can't see a pathway in here. I worked in the old nightshade guild first, chopping and dropping, and then I came down into the old Four Sisters guild. So I haven't gotten here quite yet. Here's some kind of, quote, weed that's just growing. I think these are some kind of, like, wild daisy or something, actually, when they flower. They get 
They'll flower towards the end of summer, I think it was. But they're playing host to insects. Look at this weird insect. I have no idea what it is. Looks kind of cool. Looks like a predator of some kind. I, I don't know why I say that. I think it's probably the front legs. He looks like he's going to you know, do some, do some work on uh, some of our da damaging insects. Here we have some hyssop that we planted last year. And now since it's a perennial, it's growing now in its second year and making some nice flowers. Another section of beds from the old Four Sisters, real thick planted. Again, the diversity in here. We have a lot going on, so very proud of it. Like to see this. This is what you want to see. Thick, heavy growth that's not wilting and dying. That's oregano dead center. This is not a great picture. I have a lot of pictures in this from this day. We're still on the 22nd. Uh, some other kind of... Uh, insect, some kind of flying insect. He's sitting on top of a uh, horse tail. He's not in focus. Uh, a lot of mine aren't in focus. Uh, sometimes they move really quick and other times they don't. And Sometimes you just don't check your exposures uh, as you go. This is now under deep shade, one of those mounds that we built with tomatoes and garlic and everything else that's going in here. Not very thick, not a lot going on, but there are a lot of small plants, a lot of small plants. But remember, this was finished in the winter this mulch hasn't had time to break down there's no compost in here or anything so uh, it is what it is and that's subsoil those mounds are basically built from subsoil because they're from the bottom of the ponds looking north uh, in, sorry looking south into the garden cover crop cover crop you remember three or four months ago, this was a couple inches high. There was this was very low to the ground. There wasn't it. There were some flowers from the cabbages and everything, but for the most part, it was uh, very low key. And now we're at the end of May, and it's just bursting with life in its second year. This is year two. This isn't a very old site yet, so you can. Imagine in the future once we get those shrubs in that I've been harping about once we get some shrubs in once we get the soil prepared for all these different wonderful uh, fruits that we can eat They're gonna be ready for it. This this is a good sign that our soil is being structured bottom right. This is a lot of uh, Dock or sorrel not sorrel, but it's like a dock Just letting it do its thing ants ants coming into the garden a lot of people hate ants People just, people just hate. I think people like to hate. That must be, unfortunately, I think that's innate in human nature just to hate things. Um, but look at what they're doing. That they're excavating this clay for us. And they are bringing in air. The only bad thing about the ants is see this grass here. This is some kind of crab grass. It follows ants. Ants in this grass get along really well. I've noticed this. Uh, wherever those ants burrow, this grass creeps along right behind it going, yeah, you're tilling the soil for me. Don't like that aspect of it, uh, but I do like ants. They're hardworking fellow creatures. Here's some black burrs, black burrs, blackberry plants. We had tried to transplant all of them, but obviously we missed a couple of roots. That white clover is now gone. And we've got a lot of small plants growing up in here. That's where we did a seed mix. We'll talk about that later once we can actually identify some of the plants in these pictures. The crimson clover is nearing the end of its reign underneath the uh, plum. It's a short-lived annual, so we can't expect too much out of it. That's why we tried to sow in some of our native perennial nitrogen fixers and ground covers. We did. We put them in, in uh, seed balls, but none of them sprouted. But... Seeds can sometimes come up a year, maybe two years later. Here are our line of sunflowers and peas. And underneath the oak, towards the west end of the oak, we had a lot of whatever this is. I'm not really sure what this is. Never really bothered to find out too much, but it grew really thick, really tall. And I like things that grow really tall and really thick on the west hand side because the wind comes from there and it's going to slow down this wind. And it's breaking up the soil. Look at how many stems are coming up from just one of the bases from these plants. So they're really mining the soil, loosening it up. Uh, here's another of the bases. You can just see how 
there's a there must be a very vigorous root system underneath these plants and that and we don't have anything planted there ourselves so why not let nature fill that niche for us here's the south end of the oak tree and you've got that relative of Vietnamese mint which has these purple markings on the leaves but dead center is some kind of melon that is trying to grow up out of this compost pile um, there's morning glories all sorts of things in this picture old sangria fruit that we just throw out just do whatever here's some of these plants that we have you know they're ready to transplant the shrubs and the um, trees and everything that we're trying to get out just another view and let's see yeah just that's the old nightshade guild I mean old green green guild okay that was the 22nd here's the 29th check my time is that six, okay, 16 minutes okay good we've got plenty of time to get done because now we're on the 29th of May and you can tell that we've done some chop and drop here dead center this is in the old nightshade guild but still really thick otherwise you know all of this down below at the bottom it's not in focus I know it's not in focus the bottom you can see some new growth of the red clover the seed heads that you see are from the crimson clover and we're waiting until they're ready before we pick them. We actually would go through and pick the seeds and save the seeds so we can spread them elsewhere. Um, you know they're ready when you can just grab your, put your hand around it and pull ever so slightly and the seeds just come off in a big clump in your hand. That's when you're you know the seed heads are ready. So they weren't ready yet, but we already have one foot, foot and a half tall red clover and alfalfa after chop and dropping. And of course the onions are a wonderful nectary plant. If you can wait long enough for them to flower, I don't know any other flower, uh, flowering species that has this many flowers in one spot. It's a globe. They, they turn into globes of flowers. This is the bee balm that is now coming out full flower. A little bit darker exposure. You can see some of the color and we've got you know, the bees are already on it. The bees are already on They're not. Some of these flowers aren't even all the way open. And you've got <laughs> bumblebees trying to break into them. It's just insane. And here's that regrowth. I just showed you this from, was it the 22nd? This is one week later where this was all brown at the bottom. And we've got six, seven inch high red clover already. You can chop it more than once a season. Dead center in the light are great blue lobelias that are beginning to flower as well very early in the season they flowered uh their first year in the in the winter time well actually the late fall and then now it's it's may and they're already getting ready to uh put on a display and there's more onions black eyed susans getting ready to give it a go the you know, these were transplanted just a couple months ago as well <clears throat> from another garden they weren't even from seed here's a female cardinal I think I've got a few pictures of her our cardinals really love our garden the cardinals males females whatever they come around here's our first tomatoes that are beginning to uh, set fruit wonderful just wonderful again don't, we don't water them to do anything. Now these are crazy. I don't know what this is. Obviously it's some kind of fungus, but they look like sea anemones, sea urchins or something. This is on a, a pine stump. So it's, it's some kind of decomposing fungi. Just otherworldly. Love it. Hey, it's an artsy picture. Skip. Um, underneath one of the pine trees where we had a lot of poison ivy and I had to sheet mulch and put down a whole lot of wood chips in order to make sure no sunlight got down to any little bit of uh, poison ivy to make sure they didn't come back up. I put in seeds of cool season crops underneath the pines. I would hope even with a little bit of filtered light and cooler temperatures that we might be able to get them to grow. Didn't 
work so well. As you can see, they don't look healthy. These plants are really small. Their leaves got all funky shape to them and everything. So I wasn't too happy with that, but it was an experiment. You have a lot of seed. You just try stuff. Here's the 30th. I've got a lot of pictures from here as well. Yeah, there's a ton of pictures from here. Over the fence and into the garden. Look at all these peas. A lot of these peas, peas are a vegetable that usually don't make it into your kitchen. Because you just eat them on the go. Chop and Drop has arrived to the old Four Sisters. As you can see, keeping it into the beds. Uh, a lot more growing space now for the garlic and everything else to uh, sort of spread their wings a little bit. Here's our comfrey patch. That This is where the water would overflow from the swale if we get a crazy, crazy rain. Because remember, now I've got that monk put in. But you can see all the... Uh, the spread of my comfrey plants coming in here. It's the same area. Now you, this one is a very clear image of the chop and drop of the red clover in the beds and the white clover on the pathways that has been chopped. We must have had a little bit more rain because the pond's up a little bit. Hard to really see too much, uh, you know, without zooming in, but yeah, dead center, this dark black area, that's some mulch. Uh, when we were transplanting into this berm, because we transplanted some of those lupines and the uh, indigos, I think that's probably what that other image was from the last slideshow that I said was false indigo, but it was more than likely... Um, one of the Baptisia species, so one of the wild indigos. And the wood mulch, we learned a lot about wood mulch in the last uh, last year and how it's pretty hydrophobic, actually, at first, and how it actually takes a lot of water uh, before the plants really even get to anything sometimes. So we would actually soak the mulch before we put it down around the plants, just thoroughly saturate you know, four, a three to four inch thick layer of mulch around each plant. So that way, uh, the plants would actually be able to get some more water. And it worked out pretty well. You know, that's just more of that Four Sisters. Uh, a lot of these pictures, you know, I've, I've gotten down, um, you know, about two, almost two meters tall. So getting down to about a meter off the ground, looking at it, this is the swale for the sec second swale with all this comfrey that's coming up. And I think this looks like a healthy start. This is a really healthy start to a new paradigm. Uh, bamboo poles just strung together with some twine real quick. What they're doing is they're keeping the uh, water hyacinth to the sunny side of our pond so we'll get the most growth because otherwise the wind blows them around and they'll, they'll get underneath the oak tree in full shade and they don't really do too much there. And remember, we're trying to get biomass from these uh, we're trying to get them to help filter some of this water out, which isn't working too well yet, but it's gonna. It, the water's getting a lot cleaner. It's not quite as muddy as it normally would be uh, because now we've got a lot more plant growth, and the plants are going to be filtering the water very well for us. This is what I was talking about with uh, saturating the mulch before we put it down. You've got lupins. You've got um, okra growing in here, some squash. There are tomatoes wild onions which are i think it was the nodding onion is what we bought and uh, all sorts of different species in here we got a cover crop at first because remember i didn't double dig it's just sheep mulch so we want to uh, put in some kind of cover crop to loosen that soil before we try to get some real production out of it these images are just showing how thick everything's growing and this is what we were concentrating our time and effort on was this one new patch of the garden not trying to overwhelm ourselves and putting in hardy species that won't need too much and this area produced a lot of squash uh, for my parents this summer after I left they got more squash than they could use uh, wonderful wonderful when you have a I mean, the rest of the garden, like here, we've got tomatoes that we don't even worry about. This is that blueberry mound with tomatoes. 
and Comfrey and uh, Black Eyed Susan's Lemon Balm. You, it's great. It really is awesome. We're so happy with it. Uh, looking north, I keep saying looking north. Whenever I look uphill, I think north for some reason. I don't know. It's just strange. Um, the thick horse tails in the bottom left. And this is another one of those mounds that had garlic growing in it. The garlic's still there. It's really leggy. And we've got Cosmos that's come up by itself. And it's neat to walk around and watch plants grow on their own instead of having to babysit all the time. Here's this blueberry plant that I took all those pictures of earlier in the spring loaded with blueberries. And it's only a couple feet tall. This is a small bush. It's only, you know, it's the second year growing here. So... I'm, I can't wait to see how big these things are going to get. Think about how many blueberries they're going to be able to pull from that without doing anything. Um, here we've chopped and dropped and started uh, another section of the garden. on another, This is an extension of this hugel bed. This mini hugel bed that we had that got caught off, you know, cut off from the rest of its sinuous mounds that go underneath those pine trees. Uh, so this area gets a pretty good amount of sun. And the chickweed had been putting a lot of uh, effort into, you know, colonizing it and getting some earthworms into there. So we ended up turning that into a, a garden bed. And this picture, just looking from the same vantage point out into the garden, two years ago this would have been semi-green grass cut very low as far as the eye can see. And the trees would have been much less full. They would have been growing, they would have been doing something, but I can guarantee you that this is much healthier than it was before. I keep saying that. Here's a transplanted black locust into the uh, one of the blueberry, in both of the blueberry mounds we put one black locust, and what we're doing with that, even though they're a suckering species, we're really going to chop and drop these. The, the ones that are in these blueberry mounds inside the fence, we're going to try to grow them into one standard tree. Uh, so that they'll provide pollen and uh, everything else, as well as fix nitrogen for our blueberries. Because the blueberries are going to get, you know, swamped by this heat. Uh, as it keeps getting warmer and we have these record summers, they're going to need some of that afternoon shade. And since they're up on a mound that's on a berm, they're going to get enough sunlight in the morning and the evening to fruit uh, without having to worry about them overheating and dying. So this this is going to be a uh, a good support species for them. Here are those water hyacinths again being pushed up against the sunny side. Uh, we've got, this is one of the zucchinis that's coming out on that new sheet mulched area. And like I said, I don't know anything else that has this many flowers. What are we at? We're at 28 minutes. Whew. We got a ton of pictures from May. This is ridiculous. <laughs> I like this picture. Uh, it's just, it turned out kind of nice, black and white. More lettuce. More lettuce. Uh, cucumbers, tomatoes, basil, um, cilantro, parsley, tobacco, sunflowers, everything. And this is that bed that we just prepared. Uh, from all the chickweed, here it is. It's not huge, but you can grow a lot of food in something this size. Now we're getting the Black Eyed Susans. They're just gonna open up for us. And we terrace this, many little terraces around here, so uh, we'd slow some of the water down and uh, hopefully it produced a fair amount, because remember I'm not there anymore, so I don't really know these things. Um, I think it probably produced some tomatoes and more photos, wide angle shots, everything's nice and chopped and dropped and uh, coming back on for a second round, this bee balm, can't get enough of the bee balm, so excited to see those growing. We're going to have five varieties, five native bee balms that are just going to be attracting all sorts of insects. And they're also a tea. You can make tea out of the leaves of almost all of these species. And that's supposed to be pretty good. That was back to the beginning for there. And since that was the 30th, that's it. 
We got done right at 30 minutes. All right, thanks for stopping by for me.